Daniel prepares students for impactful careers, and I'm honored to introduce each one of them. After my introduction, uh, each one of these uh, panelists in order will we'll take a little while to talk a little bit about their story, and then I'll engage all three panelists in a conversation based upon questions uh, that you brought to uh, my attention. First of all, Chini Celebrado Royer was born in Naga City, Philippines, and immigrated to the U.S. in 2005. She's a multidisciplinary artist who uses discarded and found materials to create installations, sculpture, paintings, and drawings that reflect a sense of urgency, a transient quality, and the precariousness of objects. Her works often reference architectural structures and their deterioration. Her work has been exhibited at the Walters Art Museum, the Fjord Gallery, School 33 Arts Center, the Peel Museum, Syndicate Gallery, and Space Camp. She was a finalist for the 2019 Janet and Walter Sondheim Artscape Prize, was an Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design Teaching Fellow in 2017, and a recipient of the Toby Devin Lewis Fellowship Award in 2014. She served in the AmeriCorps Community Art Collaborative for Refugee Youth Project, was an assistant professor at the Pratt Institute and completed an artist residency in the post bac program at the Maryland Institute College of Art. She's currently an assistant professor at the Rhode Island School of Design. As a student, Cheney was a member of Alpha Phi Omega, Ars Nova Art Club, and the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. She earned her bachelor's in studio art from McDaniel and her master's in fine arts from the Maryland Institute College of Art. Jasmine Chavez Cruz grew up in Falls Church, Virginia, and is originally from El Salvador. She is passionate about advocating for immigrant rights. In fact, Jasmine's been advocating for the rights of the immigrant community since she was 14. Growing up, she organized town halls and clothing and food drives, ensuring community members were not only informed about their rights, but that they had enough to eat and clothes to wear. Jasmine's currently working in Washington, D.C. at AARP's Legal Council for the Elderly. She does Latinx outreach and works closely with 50 plus low income Latinx community. In November, 2019, she went to the border with a group of passionate activists providing pro bono assistance for refugees. Jasmine currently serves as the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, Deputy Director for Virginia, and in 2018 was awarded LULAC's National Woman of the Year Award. She also serves as Director of Engagement for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Alumni Association in DC. And she sits on her alma mater's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Advisory Group. In 2013, she was a featured speaker at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's 37th Annual Awards Gala. Jasmine also sits on the Smithsonian Latino Center's Young Ambassadors Alumni Network Advisory Group. And she serves as the Todos con Biden Youth Committee Chair. As a student, Jasmine founded and served as president of McDaniel's League of United American Latin American Citizens, and she was also named a Newman Civic Fellow and was one of 273 student leaders nationwide recognized by Campus Compact. She served as an admissions tour guide, a member of Omicron Delta Kappa, vice president for the SGA, and as a member of the advisory board of the college's Global Bridge Program. She earned her bachelor's in political science and Spanish from McDaniel in 2019. And finally, Jamar Daniel grew up in Long Island, New York. He's currently the vice president and senior counsel at Viacom CBS, where he uses his background and knowledge to articulate risks to clients and help them achieve their creative goals. He states that being able to work with his clients, breaking down and distilling complex legal theories and offering a human touch to the process is a really important part of his work. While a student on the Hill, Jamar was rarely seen without a book. He also loved music. He sold tapes on campus during his freshman year. He always had hopes of working in the music industry. A year after graduating McDaniel, Jamar decided to attend law school, believing it would be a great choice and develop skills to practice law or go into business. He also knew he had never met a lawyer who looked like him, and he hoped to change that. The summer after his first year, he attended a coveted clerkship with Honorable Sterling Johnson Jr., a U.S. District Court judge in the Eastern District of New York who taught him you can do anything with a law degree except practice medicine. And he was right. Although Jamar had been looking into commercial real estate law, the next summer he was offered an internship in the Business and Legal Affairs Department at Black Entertainment Television, BET. What he always thought was a pipe dream became a reality that he's been living for the better part of a decade. As a student, 
Jamar was a member of the Black Student Union, the men's basketball team, and the outdoor track team. He also served as an RA and was the founder and organizer of the Hurricane Katrina Food Drive. He earned his bachelor's degree in history from McDaniel and a JD from American University. These are three really remarkable young alumni. And so I'd like to turn the floor over to them so that they can share more of their story. So please join me in welcoming Cheney, Jasmine and Jamar back on the Hill and I'll turn things over to Cheney. Thank you, President Casey. Um, I have a little cheat sheet so that I don't you know, get distracted. So I guess I'll just talk about um, th this talk will function as a footnote for what President Casey uh, described as my resume. So starting with a, a personal bio, I was born in the Philippines and lived there till I was about 13 years old. And when I was 13, I was adopted by my cousin who lives in the US and that's how I ended up in this country. Uh, the photo that is uh, being shared right now that is projected is uh, one of my early works. Um, the, the background of this photograph is my childhood home. It was very small, sort of dilapidated, but it served its purpose uh, in providing the shelter for my family and I. I discovered this uh, photograph towards the end of my time at McDaniel when my sister sent me a copy via email. Uh, it was one of the family, it was the only family photo that, that I owned. Um, the rectangles represent each member of my family. The colors were based on the shirts that we were wearing that day. When I was in McDaniel, my art was mainly focused on uh, personal history and, and memory. So life in the U.S. So as I mentioned before, I moved to the U.S. when I was 13 and at the age of 13, um, it was, it was kind of a, it was a complete culture shock to, to be in this country, to be starting uh, school, middle school, the most awkward phase in life. Um, and I didn't speak English then. And so I had to take a bunch of ESL classes as, as well as the required courses that, um, that was required in middle school and, and throughout high school also. So language became one of the greatest struggles in, in trying to adjust to this completely different culture than, than I was used to. Um, and art kind of, it was that time that art became sort of this, this vehicle for communication uh, because it, it didn't require for me to, to speak. Um, it also helped interpret concepts that I learned in school. So, and the, it was a lot less intimidating when it came to explaining what I learned from class. Um, it also kind of helped me academically to, you know, help my grades essentially uh, because I was so bad at writing papers and um, making presentations in general. Um, so I took advantage of, of extra credit opportunities and kind of taking a different take on what uh, the project or the assignments might might ask. And then fast forward, uh, trying to choose a college or university. Um, I applied to several colleges and universities uh, all throughout Maryland. Um, and I was down to two choices. One, going to a really big university. And then the other was McDaniel, That's a little bit much smaller actually than, than the one that I was considering. Um, and then I ended up in McDaniel and it allowed me to know my professors. It, um, McDaniel also gave me a decent scholarship, uh, not to mention it has a beautiful campus, if you haven't noticed. Um, I, I took a lot of different classes besides art and art history. While I was in McDaniel, uh, I took an education course, philosophy, African-American studies, criminology, fencing, archery and um, nutrition. I mean, those are just the few things that, that I remember and um, had the most fun, I guess. And it came to deciding on a major and, and that was probably one of the most difficult um, decision that I made during, during my college years. 
Um, I probably changed my mind at least three times until I finally committed to art. And I remember my parents didn't talk to me for, for a few weeks because I ended up choosing art and I told them, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Um, so I decided to ma major in studio art and I minored in sociology. I met amazing and really supportive people who encouraged me to keep pursuing art. Uh, Dr. Erson, who I think is on here somewhere, uh, taught me different types of, you know, cultural traditions around the world that, that may be uh, conflicting with the typical Western standards of, of ethics. Um, th those are just, you know, these are just a few professors that, that I remember fondly during my time there. Dr. Erson also drove me to Baltimore City to see a show. Um, it was a Filipino artist who was showing, um, who used to be a student at MICA, and I got to meet him, and, and that was kind of a, a really memorable moment for me to meet someone who, you know, who's doing something that I hope to do in the future when, when I was a student at McDaniel. Um, and Professor Pearson, who was my main advisor for my entire time in McDaniel, uh, provided critical feedback in my studio courses and helped me apply to grad school, practice my interviews with me, and um, essentially helped me arrange my portfolio to, to be able to um, present myself well when I was applying to these programs. Um, Dr. McKay made art history come alive and in in, in entertaining. Um, Dr. Dundee's taught me about institutional frameworks of the justice system. Dr. Jacoby introduced me to the ideas of ontology and epistemology, um, which I am constantly reevaluating in, in the way that I make my work. Uh, these particular courses and the ones that I didn't mention still uh, play a significant role in the way that I create and teach my students. So fast forward again, graduate school. So after McDaniel and after I graduated from McDaniel in 2014, I decided to attend graduate school. I got into a program in MICA in Baltimore um, and I got my MFA. So I was there, there for two years. Uh, grad school helped further expand, expand the knowledge uh, from my undergraduate studies and investigate how these subjects might come together. I didn't always know the right answers, but I worked tirelessly using the feedback and knowledge that I acquired both in undergrad and grad school. Um, while attending grad school, I was also constantly bugging Professor Pearson to let me visit his classes so that I can practice doing critiques uh, in front of my students, which I now frequently do since it's, I'm an art, art professor. Um, let's see, what else? So at the end of grad school, I received a sizable grant, which allowed me to rent a studio space in Baltimore and paid for my living expenses as I looked and applied for jobs. And most of the jobs that I applied for were, were teaching jobs. So from 2016 till 2019, I was constantly um, changing jobs every single year. Um, my first job I got through networking in MICA I found out about a community art teaching position for a nonprofit organization in Baltimore City, working with newly arrived refugee students. I worked there for about 10 months, uh, teaching art, English, mentoring, and fundraising. Um, these are mostly, I was teaching mostly elementary, middle, and high school students. And at night, after work, I would go back to my studio and paint, and that was kind of my way of decompressing from a long day. Um, so while maintaining my job in Baltimore, I was also applying and interviewing for other teaching jobs. One day I received an email about one of the, oppor uh, one of the opportunities I applied for. It was a post-grad uh, teaching fellowship in New York. It was a one-year full-time uh, teaching position in Pratt Institute. Um, I wasn't quite ready to leave Baltimore, so I decided to commute from Baltimore to New York every week. Half of my week I spent teaching in New York, and then the other half I spent in Baltimore in my studio, continually uh, making work. I also was doing 
a bunch of uh, other shows while maintaining uh, my job and applying to jobs and, and things like that. So it was, it's been a very busy uh, last few years. In 2018, before my contract in New York ended, I started to send emails and reach out to every single department or faculty member I knew at MICA. Fortunately, I received an email from the director of the post back program in grad studies, and he told me that there is a position available. So I interviewed for the job and I got it. I ended up working there for a year while continuing to look for a full-time job or a more long-term uh, position. And in 2019, I applied to a position in, in RISD where I am now. I interviewed uh, at a conference in New York and then a week later, they invited me to an on-campus visit where I had to give a lecture about my work in front of the faculty members, uh, conduct critique in a drawing class and do interview with the provost. At the end of the uh, spring in, in 2019, I was offered a full-time position in RISD and I remember talking to Professor Pearson and Dr. Harrison to, to ask for advice. I had no idea how to negotiate regarding my salary and benefits. Uh, Etc. And so they gave me the the rundown of how to do it, and it was, it's been pretty surreal. Um, it's been a lot of work, but uh, and it wasn't always easy. But I'm definitely grateful, you know, for for where I am today. And these these things wouldn't have happened without those people supporting me. Wow. So thank you. Thank you, Cheney. Uh, Jasmine. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasmine Chavez. I grew up in Falls Church, Virginia, and I am originally from El Salvador. If there is a way to explain my journey as a low income immigrant in this country with one word, it would be the word resilience. When my family came to this country from El Salvador, I was only a baby. Imagine having to start over in a new country, not knowing anyone and not knowing the language. I am thankful to community organizers who were able to help my family when we came to this country. I didn't know this then, but it was the selflessness of my community members that inspired me to become a community organizer and to give back to my community from a very young age. When I graduated high school, I was the first in my family to do so. It was a monumental moment for my family and I. Coming from a low income background, all odds were against me in obtaining higher education. This is why my high school and college graduation was so special. It was my parents' sacrifices and love that got me to those really big moments in my life. Growing up, my mother always instilled in me the importance of giving back to the community and education. I wasn't even in middle school when my mom began to bring her friends over so that I could translate documents for them. When I was old enough to comprehend what the terms that I was reading about were, I realized that my community was under attack, specifically my immigrant community. Around this time in my life, I realized that I wanted to do more for my community. And around the age of 16, I began to lobby with the Virginia Coalition of Latino Organizations because I wanted to use my voice to do more for the immigrant community. I really wanted to tell my lawmakers about the injustices I saw in the immigrant community, and I wanted to advocate for policies that would pos positively affect the immigrant community. It was around this time as well that I also took my voice to Washington, D.C. and lobbied with LULAC, which stands for the League of United Latin American Citizens. And through lobbying, I realized that while we can't change everyone's minds, we do have the ability to change people's hearts with our stories of resilience. I hope to be a policymaker someday so that I can provide and advocate for policies that positively impact my community. A bulk of my work has focused on organizing my community and I have seen the power of organizing in my own neighborhood and in communities that I have come to call home. And speaking of home, making McDaniel my home for four years was the best decision of my life. At McDaniel, I grew as a person professionally, made amazing friends and gained a lot of amazing mentors like Dr. McNichols, Dr. Mangiello, Dr. Leahy, Dr. Jennifer, Terry, and so many others. 
I'm so sorry, I, I forgot um, to include you. My mentors really made me feel at home on the hill and still cheer me on to this day. I chose McDaniel because it was, school that wanted, it was a school that wanted to invest in me. It wanted to provide me with resources and it empowered me to become the professional and the person that I am now. I was also looking for a small liberal arts college that had a really good political science and Spanish program, which is what I ended, ended up majoring in. I had also seen McDaniel in a book called Colleges That Change Lives, and that book was not wrong. When I visited McDaniel, I knew that the school was for me. I was given a tour with my dad and everything was personalized for us. And I really could see myself at thriving, thriving at McDaniel for four years. When McDaniel became my home, I founded the League of United Latin American Citizens on campus and served as president for three years. It was the most amazing experience for me personally and professionally. We organized summits, teach-ins, voter registration drives, attended the Emerge Latino Conference every year, and we did so much more, and they are still doing amazing work on campus. I was recently appointed the Virginia Lulex State Director, which is a big honor and incredibly humbling um, because it is something that I have always dreamed about. I'm excited for the work that I'm gonna do in the state of Virginia. And if we have any alums or students that wanna get involved with LULAC, please feel free to connect with me after the call. Fast forward to after college, all of my wildest dreams came true. In November, 2019, I went to the border with a couple of amazing activists. There, I assisted refugees with their asylum applications and put to work the skills that I had obtained at the law firm that I was working for at the time. It was an incredibly powerful and emotional experience for me because I saw what was going on at the border with my own eyes. I met families with the same dream that my parents had when they brought me to this country. This is why I am pursuing a master's in public policy to someday write policies that positively affect my community. I was at an immigration law for a year and a half after college and just recently in September, 2020, I joined a group of amazingly talented, selfless and kind women at Legal Counsel for the Elderly. I wake up every day thankful because I get to work closely with the 50 plus low income Latinx community. I have been connecting Legal Counsel for the Elderly with organizations like LULAC during outreach efforts to reach more 50 plus Latinx individuals who need legal representation but can't afford it. It is truly wonderful to be doing this work. For the students listening to this conversation, I encourage you all to follow your dreams and to really get involved in your community and on campus. Your voice matters. And oftentimes as young people, we tend to think that no one will listen to us, but people do. As someone who has lobbied in DC and in Richmond from a very young age to now, um, I see the impact that my voice has had. And you know, at 24 years old now, I am still the youngest person in many spaces that I occupy and I wish to see more young people and more Latinas in these spaces. And I know that someday you will also be in the spaces and I'm excited to see that happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, Jamar. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm, uh, I'm overjoyed to be a part of this panel with uh, such esteemed alums. And uh, you know, I'm happy to share my story. Uh, I am a... Uh, I'm a, uh, a child of a single parent from Long Island, Elmont to be specific. Um, I found out about McDaniel actually by chance. I was on a recruit, I was playing basketball in a basketball tournament at University of Maryland. And uh, I was approached by Coach Selby who was assistant coach of the basketball team at the time. And he mentioned McDaniel uh, and you know, I, I, he gave me a, a brochure and I took the brochure, went home, it was, a, uh, McDaniel was amongst a, a bunch of different schools that I was interested in. But, um, you know, I looked at the brochure and I really thought that, you know, one, the campus was beautiful, as Cheney said um, from the pictures. Uh, but, uh, you know, it also struck me that the school was serious about educating um, young professionals um, and took it very seriously. And uh, it just happened that one of my history teachers, uh, Mr. Jim Hegman, was a former basketball player on uh, the on uh, 
um, Western Maryland when the school is still called Western Maryland. And I mentioned to him that uh, I was approached by McDaniel College and he suggested I go check it out on a visit. So uh, I actually went down on a visit. I met up with the coach at the time, which was Coach Doe. And uh, upon that visit, you know, I, I was stunned again by the physical beauty of the campus. It's essentially what I envisioned as, uh, as it's essentially what I thought a college campus would be. And uh, when, when leaving the campus, I kind of made up my mind at the time, uh, you know, so but let me take a step back. Now, college was really never an option in my household um, from, you know, from as long as I can remember, uh, my mother never really specifically forced college on my sister and I, but my mother is actually uh, getting her MBA right now. So uh, this is, this will be her uh, third or fourth degree. I can't remember. So my mom was always in the process of getting a degree or, you know, or, or studying for something. So it was, uh, you know, we learned by example in my household and it was not, again, it was never really an option, but I, I really, um, as you mentioned in the biography, I was, I was always a fan of literature and my mother fed that. I'm also a fan of sports and music and I was able to um, feed that on my own, but my mother made uh, created an environment in which uh, education was a priority. Education was something that was something to be proud of and not to shy away from. So again, uh, once uh, after visiting the school, talking to my mother, it, we made the decision that McDaniel was was the school that I was going to attend um, in fall two thousand and three. Uh, you know, when when it it was a it was a culture shock and full disclosure, I actually crashed the car the night before we drove down um, to uh, to, uh, to uh, move into school. So my mother wasn't completely happy with me, but uh, one, I was really happy to kind of be out of the house at that point because it was just, uh, it, would, it would have been a lot of static, but uh, I was just really happy to kind of be on my own and be in a different state, you know, Long Island where I'm from, it's actually kind of borders Queens. So it's, uh, suburban but if if anyone's familiar with new york or that part of new york it's um there's uh it's high density so it wasn't like westminster so when you know driving into westminster was 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 jarring uh again uh and i i, I really i will never forget that moment realizing that this is where um i'll be for the next four years uh and and it was it was exciting um, more than anything it was exciting and it was uh, an opportunity for me to grow in different ways but I wasn't aware that I was gonna really grow until meeting faculty, um, who I think changed my life for, for the better. Um, I'm gonna rattle off a few names again. Um, I'm, I'm probably the oldest alum on this panel by far. Um, I think uh, someone, I, I think Cheney graduated 2019 and, um, and uh, Julia graduated 2014. So I think uh, Jasmine, I'm sorry, 2014. So I'm 07, so please forgive me if I butcher a few names, but. Um, I, I think my experience uh, was really, uh, really, the, the people that stand out in my experience was Dr. Barry Jacoby. Um, that was my first course, which was, uh, which was Introduction to Critical Thinking. And uh, I really never was exposed to philosophy uh, up until that point. And to me, it kind of epitomized uh, what you would, what you should be learning at college at that time in my life. Um, I did not really have any kind of guiding principles outside of, you know, knowing what's right and wrong and treating people fairly, which is things that I've been taught, taught and, and have been instilled in me since I was a child. But having um, a better understanding of why it's important to, to think for yourself or, or actually question and test your um, test your beliefs um, was something that I was taught or exposed to um, in that course, and still influenced me to this day. There's never a point where I'm reading a newspaper now. Um, I'm not trying to go through that whole practice of understanding who's writing it or where does it come from, what's the slant. And I think this that course changed my life. And I always tell young younger people when I'm speaking to them is that. Uh, I wish that this that course or what was taught in that course was taught at you know, uh, earlier in the educational process, and um, I think the country needs that right now. Um, we are uh, in, in, in um, dire need of critical thinking and 
and being able to reflect on our beliefs and, and testing whether or not they stand up to um, analysis. Uh, another professor that really stands out to me and that kind of epitomizes my experience at uh, McDaniel's, Dr. Upton. Um, Dr. Upton, um, tremendous guy all around, uh, you know, pretty decent athlete. And uh, we, we used to play uh, pick up basketball with him. And, um, and, you know, he really kind of showed myself or showed me the way the world actually works and gives historical context to the systems and the processes uh, that are in place now. Um, institutional, uh, geopolitical, he kind of gave me a framework in which to understand um, the world and give me context. He was the first person to actually uh, teach me, or I would say the class, uh, about um, wealth distribution and wealth inequity. And, uh, and, I, and it wasn't something that I've ever heard before. Uh, and it was, you know, a well before it was became a vote to actually have that as a part of a talking point in terms of policy. And so I, I really credit him for opening my eyes and, uh, and kind of, you know, if my mother was a soil for my educational, um, for my, for, for my love for education, he kind of helped provide the fertilizer in a sense. Um, and, you know, also uh, Dr. Feely and Dr. DePay, uh, who, you know, just conversations with them about academic writing and um, also having just conversations about why, you know, what, what's the best way to convey a thought and how to best convey a point of view uh, helped me um, in my uh, legal career and help allow me to learn how to communicate in more succinct fashion. Um, that was one of the things that really jumped out to me. Dr. DePay, I don't believe he's still teaching here, but um, he was, uh, he might've been um, an adjunct at the time, uh, but he was uh, really uh, instrumental in terms of helping me um, refine my writing. And so I, I definitely credit him for that. Um, one thing that really stands out to me, aside from uh, being a part of the men's basketball family, um, who I, I, I still, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm a, still a very large part of that. Uh, you know, I love the team, and um, you know, I want to shout out my, my teammates who I played with and, and, the, and the young young players who are who may who might actually be on the call. Uh, you know, I just want to encourage them and tell them that you know we should definitely take advantage of the opportunity is to be student athletes, but definitely um, take the student part just as serious as we do the athlete part. Um, and so the men's basketball team was a, a family. Uh, and to this day, we, we still get together and talk regularly, but more than that, more than that, the school community, um, I felt like I was really a part of the school community and uh, which led me to join the BSU, which also led me to be, um, actively involved in the Hurricane Katrina um, food drive. And, you know, when I thought about, you know, starting a food drive, it was welcome with, uh, you know, the the first person I, I went to Residence Life, I can't remember the Residence Life quarter it was at the time, but I, I brought that idea to her and she was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Well, how can I help? Or here are these resources, here are these people in town that we could um, drop the food off with. And I couldn't believe it because I never did anything like that in my life. But it was so uh, she was so open to actually helping and making it happen. Uh, I was kind of taken aback by that. And so that is, you know, that's just one example of how the school helped create uh, or uh, planted the seed that people generally do want you to see you succeed. And the world is not necessarily aligned against you. And, you know, people will be receptive to your ideas. So that's one thing that school definitely left me with. And one thing I really take away from my experience of being at McDaniel. Um, one, an, another thing, um, and, I, and, and I would be remiss to, uh, to not mention it, is that you know, the, our experience at McDaniel is, uh, is a special time. And sometimes I go back on the campus. I went back to the campus last year with my daughter and just walked around and it really um, brought a lot of emotions and a lot of, uh, you know, it, it made me uh, thankful for my time there. And, you know, I, as a history major, I'm very, um, I find that 
you know, nostalgia and, and, and being conscious of what happened in the past is very important. And so in terms of telling the story um, of our lives uh, to future generations and informing future generations and helping them not make the same mistakes, uh, or even if we did something correct, mirror that. Um, but, you know, it, it, again, um, being a young black male from where I'm from, and uh, and learning um, the things that I've learned and being exposed to the people that I've been exposed to, it was a tremendous blessing. Um, you know, I think about Dr. Upton bringing um, Henry Louis Gates to campus, which is like a rock star now to me because I'm I watch PBS with my daughter, and so like I'm kind of washed. But you know, that was something that I really uh, appreciated, and I'll never forget. Um, so, you know. It, I think McDaniel College punches above his weight class in terms of experience, the experiences that we have and the, the quality of education and the quality of support that we get, which is not often stated in catalogs. You can't um, market that, but you know, once you're here, uh, I, I, I think that it's very apparent that the school wants to see you succeed and, and will stop at nothing to actually do that. Um, so I'm going to go give a, a quick uh, recap of how I got to where I'm at. Um, so I'm, after school, um, I, uh, I took some time off to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And um, upon, you know, thinking about what I, you know, where I wanted to go, I decided that law school was a great opportunity because it offered, you know, the ability to practice law, but then also you know, you are able to develop skills that could help and be, uh, it could be useful uh, in business. And so with that, I decided to uh, attend, um, I took my LSAT, I decided to attend um, Washington College of Law at American University down in DC. Um, you know, it was it was a nice opportunity to, to, to have uh, an experience going to school in the city versus going to school in the suburbs. Um, so it, my experience there was tremendous. Uh, again, like uh, President Casey mentioned, I was able to, uh, I was offered the opportunity to intern at BET, um, my second year of law school, uh, which was after I uh, did a, uh, a fellowship with uh, Judge Sterling Johnson in the Eastern District of New York my first year. Um, so my, my experience at BT was amazing. Uh, I'm still friends with a lot of the attorneys that were I was working with as an intern. I did that for two semesters, graduated a semester early and took the LSAT. I uh, did a fellowship uh, with an Italian ringtone company. Uh, ringtones, I, I, I sound super old because I don't, no one has ringtones anymore. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, everything that I've done was actually was supposed to lead me to where I'm at right now. And so I've been with Viacom since 2011, uh, my specific group since 2014. And um, I'm also now part of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. And we're trying to do some positive work in terms of making sure that um, attorneys of color at uh, minority owned law firms and, and uh, uh, attorneys, uh, diverse attorneys at major, like major law firms get opportunity to engage with our company in meaningful ways. So um, that's it for me. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna jump into uh, questions that folks have. And uh, since you got the mic right now, Jamar, let me ask you, so I'm gonna ask everyone this. So tell us what a typical if there is such a thing, a typical work day is like for you. What are you involved in? What are you doing? So uh, my day is, it differs every single day. And I think if people who know me know that's probably what best suits me. Um, I can't really sit down. And so even though um, we're really stuck at our home offices, like I, I'm jumping from issue to issue. Um, so technically I have close to a hundred clients. Um, and who have like a hundred different projects going on at the same time. And so I will usually start my day by um, looking at the, a list that I made from the night before to, in terms of what I was probably not able to finish the day before and or what I need to get done or what I need to address or emails I need to answer um, for that day. And 
usually it's a bunch of different calls about uh, various legal issues, um, sometimes potential defamation claims that we've received on shows that I work on, uh, creative projects that they need our advice on. Um, my, my team specifically, um, we touch actually almost every aspect of production and also advise on um, advise various business units on, you know, uh, intellectual property issues as it relates to being able to potentially sell or license um, content out to other uh, other um, you know for uh, uh, platforms like Netflix. And so it, it's it, it definitely varies. I know I'm probably light on the specifics, but I really don't want to bore everybody. Um, so I, I think you know generally I. I what I would really compare myself to is really kind of like an emergency room physician. I'm not making light of that, especially given what's going on right now, but, uh, but in, in, in media law. So we are really essentially the first people. Um, and uh, so that's kind of what my day looks like. So it, it, it varies. Like I have reports in California. Um, so I try to meet with them to discuss, uh, you know, whatever's on their plate. And we tend to have, uh, you know, a good bunch of meetings and sometimes presentations to clients throughout, um, throughout the day. So a typical work day, I, I teach about two, two or three times a week. And I teach for seven and a half hours drawing course. Yeah, when I'm not teaching, I'm usually making work. I'm making my own work, I'm making art. And I work on uh, committee work as well, which is, doesn't sound exciting, but, but it actually is. I'm in the admissions committee for uh, RISD. And so I review uh, prospective students' application, their portfolios and um, all sorts of things. So, you know, I, that's essentially my, my typical day or typical week, I suppose. So when are you making your art, Jeannie? When or what? Yeah, what, what's your, your process? Do you uh, try to work every day? Do you spread that out to, um, for the weekends? I mean, how, how, does, how does that work with the creative process? I try to work on it as, as much as I can. Um, normally when I'm not teaching, that's when I'm making, I'm focused on making work. But if, if I've had a, a full day and I just want to, you know, decompress, I find that just painting helps a lot with you know trying to relax and release some of the stress so yeah so what's your work like jess so i began my role uh, in september 20, 2020 um actually in the middle of the pandemic so it's definitely been interesting um for me uh based off of different things that I've heard from those who have been able to go to the office, you know, beautiful office in DC. Um, but I usually start my day off by checking my list of priorities. I usually do that a day um, before. And I'm always on Zoom calls um, as we all are during this pandemic. Um, I draft a lot of letters for our clients and I make sure to check in with my team every day about Latinx outreach and what progress has been made. I also make a lot of calls um, for our clients to the Social Security Administration. And I work very closely with the lawyers and making sure that our clients have their questions answered and, and making sure that no one is taking advantage of them. Um, and so that's a little glimpse as to what I do every day. Every day is very different though, but um, that's actually what I did today. <laughs> How has, uh, I'll, I'll stick with you here, uh, Jasmine, how's the coronavirus impacted uh, your work? For me, it's, it's definitely been interesting. Um, I, I would love to be doing this work, like this outreach at Latinx work in person. Um, I've heard that it's really awesome to get to work with the low income Latinx folks in person and talk to them. Um, about, you know, the issues that they're experiencing and, you know, connecting with the Latinx orgs in person would be wonderful as well. Um, but, you know, using phone, using Zoom, using Microsoft Teams has been useful, but I do miss that in-person, personable experience with not only our clients, but also with the Latinx organizations. 
I'm really looking forward to that in the future. But for now, I guess a phone call or a Zoom call um, will suffice. But it's still powerful work. And I'm really, really thankful for all the work that I get to do. And Jamar, what about for you? How's COVID uh, changed your world? Uh, it really hasn't. Um, I've been actually working quasi remote from since 2017. So uh, my wife and I moved down, uh, moved back to Maryland in 2017. Uh, so I left the New York office. So I would uh, be going to New York twice a month now. Um, and so it's, it was only right before uh, COVID hit when I was actually starting to go back to the office five five days a week. We have a, uh, a uh, satellite office in DuPont Circle, which I was going to right before COVID hit. So, um, you know, it, I was getting used to going back to the office, which I actually enjoyed um, being around, being in the city, but, um, you know, it really hasn't affected it that much. You know, uh, I do miss going to New York twice a month, uh, but, but aside from having to change diapers before meetings, you know, it really hasn't changed a lot. Hey, Cheney, how about you? So I've been using my apartment as my studio. So that's kind of, you know, how I continue to work. So after leaving teaching, I just transitioned to, you know, working um, in my studio. And so we have an option to to be hybrid. Um, and so I've been, you know, teaching in person, but also using Zoom to meet with, with students uh, sometimes when I'm not able to make it on campus. But typically, um, you know, since since COVID, I've, I've been teaching mostly in person with a mask and uh, socially distanced from my students. So. Uh, you know, Jasmine, when you were talking, you talked about resilience. And um, uh, certainly, I think coronavirus has added a whole lot to our aspects of resilience. But uh, can you talk specifically, uh, and, and Jasmine, since you mentioned, I'll start with you, about um, a moment in your either career or in your collegiate life where, you know, the, the importance of, of sticking with something and, and, and that resilience really was a, was a transformative moment for you. That's an amazing question, um, President Casey. I think for me personally, during during my career, um, the resilience part has always been there. I think that as a Latina, as you know, someone who comes from a low income background, as a woman, I've had to always um, really make my voice heard because you know, a lot of people won't listen to me, but I have to, you know, get my point across and make myself known in the rooms. And so I think for me, it's it's an ongoing journey of, you know, really advocating for myself, being confident in the work that I do and being confident that I will like express myself perfectly to get my point across. And so, you know, as, as I continue on, as I pursue my master's in public policy, and as I run for office someday and become a, an elected official, I think that that will continue on throughout my life. And I think that, you know, my collegiate life and my career right now as it's beginning is really helping me prepare for those moments in the future. Yeah, Jamar, you have a, a resilience story. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, it actually happened, I guess, I guess if we want to be McDaniel specific, I think it was just uh, writing my, my thesis, my senior thesis. Um, it was, uh, I believe, on the intersection um, between uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and, and their, um, how their, the radical, the from being a radical to uh, a little bit more accepted by American society, uh, there was there was like a point in time where they were actually crossing over. So Martin was actually becoming more radical, while well, Malcolm was actually becoming more palatable to American taste. And so I wrote, I was writing that, and I think uh, you know between uh, you know the the rigors of playing um, a collegiate sport, collegiate athletics, and you know just uh, also the difficulty of actually writing something like that and understanding how important it is. Um, you know, the, the, um, 
you know, the seriousness of it. It was, it was stressful. It took a lot of time. And, um, you know, there were certain points where I felt like, you know, I can't, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, but, you know, it, it, I was eventually able to, 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 to push through um, with the help and support of the history department. And, um, uh, you know, I think that was one uh, example, but I think one that I, I, I actually remember a little bit more acutely was um, I was passed over for a promotion early on in my career. And um, I remember um, uh, being really upset about it and uh, I thought I deserved it. And, you know, the, 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 the head of the group knew I deserved it, but, you know, he, I, I didn't understand how promotions worked at the time. They were limited and, and, and they had to work according to the budget. But um, I remember saying to myself the next day at the office, um, I actually went to work early that day and I was like, I'm not going to be passed up again. And I decided to, um, to to work even harder than I worked before um, to make my name, uh, to make myself a name for working hard and, and giving sound advice to my clients. And so uh, I remember exactly where I was, but since then, I think, um, you know, it was, a, it was a lesson or it was something that I'll never forget. I think it was really a turning point in my life in which um, I decided that I'm not gonna quit or I'm not gonna allow myself to, um, you know, um, uh, have any you know self pity or wallow and and, and and frustration and anger, um, so at that moment I decided that you know I'm not gonna let that happen to myself and so um, you know I think that was my moment of resilience that I, I really remember. Kenny, you have any time? Um, I think you know that the idea of resilience is is something that I learned uh, as a child in the Philippines experiences typhoons about twice a month and so if you kind of do the math it's quite often and so um yeah and a lot of those typhoons were were so unpredictable and and it actually the work that I'm doing now is is largely influenced by um by uh, reconstruction, destruction and reconstruction of architectural um, structures. And so the resilience part really is just, you know, when the typhoon comes and destroys your house, there is no time to, to wallow, but you have to um, rebuild essentially. And, uh, you know, doing that so many times or helping my family do that several times and, and also moving to this country, I, I think has, has showed that, you know, that particular trait. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty much uh, my work in, embodies uh, that particular idea. And I guess my, my own, my own character and trying, trying and trying, getting up getting back down, getting up again. And so, yeah. Uh, Jamar, you, thank you. Uh, Jamar, you mentioned uh, uh, critical thinking in the very first course was in critical thinking. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, a, a backdrop right now to this conversation in Washington is uh, uh, a discussion about, uh, you know, essentially multiple versions of what people perceive as reality. Uh, and uh, you know, our country is seemingly being ripped apart by this. Uh, Jamar, talk a little bit about, you said you're, you know, critical thinking is really important right now, uh, not only in, our, in the country, but you know, how, how do you see this playing out in the workplace? And, and what, you know, what, what really, that course obviously was, was an important aspect of it for you, but are there some other things that really made this such a central part of, uh, of who you are? Um. I think it, it really kind of helped me understand uh, or contextualize perspectives uh, and with what I do regularly. And I guess this kind of applies to what we're seeing now. Um, you know, my, sometimes even within uh, a relate the, the relationship of myself and my client, it can be sometimes perceived as adversarial. And for me to better serve them, I can't just 
actually just take what they're saying at face value sometimes. Um, sometimes they'll say things that I don't agree with, or sometimes they'll um, essentially what I would consider trying to throw me under the bus. But, you know, taking a step back and trying to understand where they're coming from, what the framework that they're coming from with, um, and, and I guess in trying to understand their, uh, their, their external pressures helps me better advise my client. And so I think a lot of times what we're seeing now is there is there's there's some, there is something considered objective reality, and I feel like that's something that we discussed. What you know, objective reality, but you know, the objective reality for someone could be colored by their own experiences. And so understanding where what's going on in somebody's life, or understanding where they're coming from, or the anxieties that they're facing, um, is 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 very important in trying to close a deal, for instance. And I think uh, it, I mean, I, I don't wanna be glib in saying like, you know, this is all transactional. We should be looking at our experiences as American citizens as transactional, but um, just kind of looking at where the other side is coming from. There's right and there's wrong, absolutely. But to better understand how to not continue to go down this path that we're going down, there needs to be an understanding of, uh, of where uh, where a lot of this is coming from, but then also we have to understand that there's such thing as fact and being able to have a record that you could point to, a central record that you could point to, um, or essentially a, a launch a launch point for conversations that we can mutually agree upon. Um, I think was um, one of the things that I I really appreciated about um, this because I think what critical thinking kind of helped me understand is, you know, the philosophical underpinnings of society. Um, they, we touched a little bit about history of certain philosophical schools of thought, but more than anything, just general philosophy, how, um, how we should go about thinking about thinking or what are some of the guiding beliefs or principles or belief systems um, that you know, our fellow citizens have. And, and so to better understand that and to think critically about them or in learning how to actually even poke holes in your own reasoning. Um, and so I find it helpful because sometimes if I miss something or if I'm in negotiations and, you know, I don't really even believe what I'm, I'm arguing for, then I, it's likely that I won't be as successful as getting what I want from my client. And, um, you know, it's very important to understand what you, how you think and what you think. And I still, to this day, still purchase philosophy books um, to, 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 to even better understand what I'm thinking. I think the, the thing that I learned and I appreciate about that class specifically is that um, it was, it's a lifelong process. It doesn't end, you know, um, we're not, we're never going to be perfect in understanding um, this. And I think the, what I really think Dr. Jacoby for is introducing me to philosophy, um, uh, which is, I, I feel, one of um, the most important aspects of liberal arts education. Um, and I think a lot of times I have colleagues who um, went to research institutions and, you know, never really actually took philosophy courses. Um, and there is a distinct difference in the way we interact with clients. Um, I'm not saying all the time, but I just think that having those experiences and having some really serious conversations um, about, you know, ontology, uh, I think it, it, just understanding that or even being able to go to that depth of, of, of thought um, and, and introspection is, is very important in becoming a professional. And I think, um, and I thank um, Dr. Jacoby for that. Jasmine, you're you're interested in going into public service. You're interested in, in becoming an elected official, and you know, with with the, uh, I'm going to apply the word craziness of what's happening in Washington right now. God, I, I'm I'm interested in, in hearing you talk a little bit about what your hopefulness in 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 being able to enter into a field and 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 do something good. I'm definitely hopeful. Um in becoming an elected official because I think that I can make positive change. I look up to people like AOC um, and Nancy Pelosi and a lot of amazing public servants who really exemplify what you know I value. And I think for me personally, 
I want to be a public servant myself because I have lived experiences that have made me realize that I do need people in the room who look like me, who, you know, speak Spanish, who, you know, are bilingual. And I think, you know, with my background in political science and Spanish, and then once I get my master's in public policy, I'll be able to bring a, a lot of different lived experiences to the table and I'll be able to relate to a lot of the people in this country. And specifically, if I do represent Virginia someday, I'll be able to relate to a lot of individuals that I have personally worked with in Virginia as an organizer, as a community activist. And so I'm hopeful that I can implement positive change. And, you know, with hard work, I, I definitely hope that, you know, this dream does become a reality. And with everything going on, I definitely think that we need this type of leadership, positive leadership that, you know, um, really focuses on making uh, a difference for underserved communities who have been for years um, left unheard. Thank you. Uh, at Chini, the, the, the world of the arts quite often gets, uh, you know, short shrift and you know, we look at our education system, it's like, you know, funding cuts in the arts and others. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, where, where you see the art as art and the arts as playing a, a critical aspect in, the, in developing citizenry as well? I think art is, is one of the most powerful tools that, that we can use uh, for advocating. And it, you know, the role of art is, is kind of presenting a different reality um, to, to the community that, that we show it to. Um, it's essentially an extension of, of ourselves as, as an artist. I mean, these particular re realities are not always seen, are, are not always popular. I mean, I think um, art has played a, a major role in, in trying to spread uh, a positive message and uh, try to spread a, a much more um, uh, I'm blacking out but uh, <laughs> sorry but I was I, I guess I was thinking a lot about what what Jamar was was mentioning earlier um, regarding education and, and critical thinking and and art that, that is, is precisely what art is supposed to do to make us think in the way that uh, is much more than the surface level. And what I appreciate a lot about my education uh, from McDaniel is that um, it, it helped me do that. The education that I, I got in the Philippines was simply you know, learning how to read and write and memorize, but not necessarily um, thinking critically about um, the information that's that's been given to me or that um, um, yeah, and, and so much of, um, so much of, of what our culture nowadays are experiencing is, uh, you know, a widespread of, of misinformation and to distinguish the, that false information, uh, in the media, I, I think is really, really important, uh, at this moment. And, uh, and I feel like social media in particular has a, a strong influence in the way that um, uh, people inform themselves, right? And I think um, most people nowadays get their, their news from, from social media and, and there's, a, there's a danger in that. And, and I think that we need to be aware in, in the way that we detect certain bias uh, from that. And so, yeah, I know I went off on a tangent, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, it's a wonderful privilege to get a chance to talk to alumni. It's been one of the things I've loved the most about uh, the job that I have. And uh, inevitably time flies uh, when we have these kinds of conversations. And uh, I thought we could wrap up by uh, just asking you if uh, briefly, if each one of you might, uh, if you were looking back at yourself as a first-year student at McDaniel, 
Um, and, uh, you know, particularly since we have so many people here tonight who are first year students and they're in a class trying to figure out what's my future going to be in a time in which a whole lot of change is going on. Uh, what's, uh, you know, one piece of advice you might uh, give to that younger self uh, as, you, uh, as you look back? And uh, Chini, you've got the mic, so I'll, I'll start with you. Um, wow, that's, that's um, I guess the simplest thing that you can do is, is take a walk. Um, go outside, take a walk with a mask on and um, reflect and just meditate and imagine a future that you want to be a part of and then, you know, start there. Ask yourself what, what, you, what it is that you want to do and keep going at it. Thank you. Jasmine, you got thoughts for your younger self? Yes, I have a lot of thoughts for my younger self, but I will focus on one specifically, something that I wish I had told myself as a first year student is to just, you know, follow your dreams and then everything will fall into place. I was always a, a person who planned everything out. I needed to know what internship I was gonna do that summer and the next summer. And so I think, you know, like just following and, you know, but being confident in, you know, following those dreams is very important, right? Because those dreams will, will happen, you know, if you put in the hard work, but, you know, also take some time to relax, take care of yourself. And so that's something I wish I had told myself, but I am telling that to the first year students. Great. Jamar, thoughts to the freshman Jamar? Yeah, so I think one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten um, is I was asking, I think um, the context was I was in, I was meeting with an executive who, uh, you know, we she had questions about some of my advice and we ended up talking about that. And then, you know, she was extremely accomplished. And so I just asked like, you know, this, you know, what is, I guess, what's her secret? She had three or four different careers, very comp like at high level. And she just asked me like, you know, just try to think about who you want to be in 10 years. Um, not where you want to be, not like what position you want, not what job, you know, you're looking for, but just who you want to be. And use that as a, as a guide and principle. Um, you want to be a good person. You want to help people um, like Jasmine's doing, you know, you want to, you want to affect the world in a positive way with art like Cheney's doing. Um, I think who who do you want to be will definitely be a great guiding principle, and you'll figure out what you're gonna do along the way. Um, I I am I was not like Jasmine. I probably didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated. I just knew I I needed to graduate, and then I'd figure it out. Um, and there's and I think. Now I'm a little bit more of a planner and I like to, to do that. Um, but I think um, just figure out who you want to be. Um, I think, you know, y'all are maybe 18, 19. So I think at this time it's, it's, it's okay to be, um, not know what you want to do. And, uh, and I, but I also think that just, if you could think about who you want to be in 10, 15 years, um, maybe not even, what you want to do with just who you want to be. And then that will probably give you um, some, a little bit of guidance. But then also I want one more thing. I think um, I was reading a book and it talks about uh, the stories we tell ourselves. And so I've noticed that, you know, for a long time, I would tell myself negative things, um, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of rein myself in to keep myself from being disappointed. So if I was disappointed, at least I knew I was going to be disappointed. And I feel like that was, a way that I kind of protected myself for a very long time. But then I started reading this book. I can't remember exactly. It's uh, by Jim Lur, um, famous tennis coach. But he talks about the psychology of tennis. And he talks about just the stories you tell yourself and, and how if you want to af affect change, if you want to change, I have some kind of positivity in your life. It's just be very conscious of what you're telling yourself, what you're feeding yourself. Um, watch your thoughts. And, you know, I think, with with conscious effort you can change the stories if they were once negative you can change them to neutral or positive and so and you'll see there's benefit behind that so um just be conscious of that and you know i think you know you'll be in in, in decent shape thank you 
The Cheney, Jasmine, Jamar, we're all incredibly proud of all that you've accomplished. And I want to thank you so much for your willingness to spend time with us tonight and sharing your, your personal stories. Uh, each one of these folks is obviously very different, but they're great examples of the power of a liberal arts education, I think, and where it can take you. You're tremendous role models, I think, for our next generation of Green Terror alumni. And I am so proud uh, to have you as a part of our McDaniel family. And before we go tonight, uh, I, I wanna mention one last thing. Uh, each one of these folks uh, spoke about either nonprofit work or internships, things that had profound impacts on their story. And as a small token of our appreciation to each one of you tonight, we want to let you know that we're making a donation in your name uh, to the Roop Stewart Endowed Fund here at the college. And this is a fund that was made possible by the support of Mark Stewart, uh, a graduate in 94, a master's graduate, and his husband, Timothy Roop. And they support student scholarships and internships with preference given to students who are taking unpaid internships in nonprofit organizations. And we're hoping that this fund can play a significant role in helping current and future McDaniel students. And uh, we wanna uh, uh, make a contribution in your honor to say thanks for tonight. And so I would ask everybody, if you please just join with me in thanking our panelists, uh, give them that digital hand clap uh, or, or turn your uh, uh, mute off and, uh, and clap away uh, as you like. And uh, I'm sorry that they can't be in person to uh, meet you and, and chat afterwards, but I promise we'll have these folks back on campus uh, once we get past this uh, pandemic and uh, give you a chance to uh, connect and, uh, and learn from them very much. So thank you all tonight. Thank you for being with us and stay well. <laughs>